Okay. Well, good morning. This is the last Sunday in September. Yes, it is. Next weekend we're into October and I think here in Melbourne perhaps our clocks change next weekend. Don't take that as definite. Check up. But for those of you who are not in Melbourne, who are watching from interstate and some later I know from overseas, we've had the excitement of an earthquake, the first in I don't know how many decades. Thankfully no one was injured and there was relatively little um, structural damage. In our house, Graham was in the old part of the house, which is on stumps, and that shook. I was in the back part of the house, which is in a concrete slab, and I heard this terrible roar, but nothing else. For the rest, um, well, anyone in Australia and anyone who follows Australian rules overseas will know that we had the grand final yesterday in Perth, where hopefully there are still no cases of community transmission of COVID. And one, the team that won had waited 57 years to win. So even the people who don't really support that team felt it was quite nice of them to have a whim. Our COVID numbers go up, but um, yep, what we're all, most of us are doing the best we can to change that, um, and hopefully that will change soon and everyone will get vaccinated. So I'm no longer looking at a camera and an almost empty church, but looking at people I know and love dearly. So, with that, I'll hand over to Graham. Thank you, Christine, <clears throat> and uh, add my welcome to, to Christine's chit-chat. You notice that she was so tactful, she didn't even mention the name of the winning team. Um, but uh, every time I think of Melbourne, I think of Bruce Brown and Steve Kong, so uh, two uh, dear friends from my school teaching days who uh, waited a long time to see their team uh, come home with the premiership. So uh, it's great to be able to join you via the internet this morning and uh, pray that uh, this time together will be good for all of us uh, in whatever situation we're in as we're viewing. I'd like to uh, begin uh, then by not only adding to my to Christine's welcome, but also uh, inviting you to join in prayer as we commence our service. So shall we unite our hearts and pray. Almighty God, we thank you that even though we're not uh, at liberty to gather, we are able uh, through the uh, amazing technology of the internet to be connected uh, with a device as as complex and yet as common as a mobile phone. And we ask that um, not only will we have a sense of being connected with, with one another as we view and share, but also with you as we learn through that amazing way in which you communicate to us by words and by deeds and by person to person sharing. We thank you for the message of the gospel. And we pray that it will work in our lives and transform us into the kind of people that you want us to be. So lead and guide us and bless this time. In Jesus' precious name, we ask it. Amen. Christine's going to come now and bring us young at heart. Well, about eight months ago, um, actually on the last Sunday in January, I spoke about a program called Stutter School, where people, I think they were all adults, were helped to gain control of their stuttering. This past week, we watched a program on SBS called Lost for Words. I was stunned to learn 
that seven million Australian adults have difficulty reading. This creates problems I had never thought of. Reading labels in the supermarket, reading signs on buses and trains. One young woman arrived, I think, at Central Station in Sydney and had great difficulty finding her way out of the station. Reading timetables at stops and stations to know when your train or bus or tram is coming and which one to take. Reading instructions on medications, following recipes. In fact, almost every area of life in our society is affected if you can't read. It also creates problems between parents and children. There was one I found it a sad moment where this lovely young mother, she's beautiful, buoyant personality, she was trying to help her daughter with some schoolwork, and I think the daughter was about six or seven. The father came into the room, and the girl turned to her dad and said, rolling her eyes, if a six-year-old can roll her eyes, she doesn't even know how to do it. And the, the lovely mother kept smiling through all that. And of course, wanting to help her daughter is a reason she is addressing her reading problems. One man in the course is 60 and desperate to get his license. But he has to learn to read first. The host on this program, whose photo I think, yes, he's, I can't pronounce his name, I should have checked it. It's Jay Lagaya. Some of you may recognize him from play school. He says it was reading books on play school that saved his life. The eight participate the eight participants in this program range in age from 19 to 60. They're linked by an overwhelming desire to read, which gives them the courage to front up to this course. It's intensive over nine weeks, and it gives them the courage to have all their weaknesses, their embarrassments, broadcast on television. They have support of family and friends, and very quickly they connect as a group. I really would encourage you to watch this three part. So there's been one of them already, and of course you can see the first episode on SBS On Demand. You can probably see them all. It's really heartwarming. The first episode, which we saw last week, ends with each participant writing a word on the sand at the beach. They were told to write a word about how they were feeling. One participant wrote, blessed. I had a whirlpool of emotions as I watched. I love reading and I would miss it terribly if I couldn't read. I was helped in this program to understand what words look like to someone who has the very specific reading disability, dyslexia. As a child, I wanted to teach my brother who had Down syndrome to read. I was surprised that my mother, who was usually encouraging of my various projects, discouraged me in this. I then learned that when Peter was born, she was told he was ineducable which was the wisdom in the 1940s and possibly beyond. Of course, I have since learned that many people with Down syndrome learn to read. But I also thought of all the people, millions displaced from their homes by war, by catastrophic weather events, some of whom live in temporary accommodation, some appallingly temporary accommodation for years, even decades, and so they can't have formal schooling. I thought of young girls in Afghanistan. Still, we hope, 
able to go to school at least to learn to read, but possibly only allowed to read the Koran and possibly not allowed to pursue their education beyond a certain age. In Scotland at the time of the Reformation, it was considered very important that every village have a teacher, a doctor and a minister. Girls and boys were to be educated together. The thinking behind this was that individual Christians had to be able to read the Bible for themselves and not just take the word of a priest or a minister. Looking back on my education, I feel I benefited hugely from that long-standing tradition and also from parents who themselves had not been able to go past 14 in education because of poor poverty in the families, but who hugely encouraged me and my sister to be educated as far as we could go. So much of what I did at school and beyond would not have been possible if I hadn't learned to read. I enjoy hearing the Bible read, and I and others are very grateful to Amanda for the way she is reading the Bible so thoughtfully for us during these weeks of lockdown. I'm looking at Amanda, not at the camera now. <laughs> However, I also enjoy reading the Bible myself. I like comparing different translations. The German Good News Bible with the NIV, Tyndall's version of the New Testament, also comparing it with the NIV. The motto of PLC, where I taught for 21 years and where Sue, who's going to be accompanying Amanda today, also taught, has as its motto, and I hope my Latin pronunciation is correct, Lex Dei Vitae Lampus, the word of God is the lamp of life. May we who can read all be grateful for the gift of literacy and may we find that God's word illuminates our path through life. May he bless us all. Good morning, everyone. I'm reading from Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, the New International Version. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. The authorities made Jason and the others pay the required amount of money to be released, and then they let them go. Amen.
Thank you, Amanda. Amen, indeed. Well, uh, we're in Thessalonica this, uh, this week in our journey through Acts. I think this is about our 13th uh, journey with the Apostle Paul. It sort of began as a road trip we couldn't have when we were locked down. And we've completed the first missionary journey. And we're uh, in the north of Greece now. <clears throat> and uh, I, I don't want to make, spend too long in Thessalonica because I, uh, I hope I... <laughs> I hope I'm not just flattering myself, but I did preach on Thessalonians uh, uh, about 20 months ago. Uh, no, it's more than that. It was uh, January 1919. So, 2019. Did I say 1919? <laughs> Once you reach a certain age, the previous century seems quite recent. <laughs> so there are some people here. All right, so I preached on Thessalonians and... Uh, and you might remember, because I got really hooked on it, that uh, I was totally fascinated by the idea that in this Greek city today, uh, the bankrupt state of Greece borrowed one and a half billion euros from the European community to build a metro. And as soon as they started to dig, they found archaeological <laughs> remains. And this picture here, which is on the cover of the leaflet, if you wish to, you can download the leaflet from the website. Uh, it depicts uh, some of the excavations filmed from a drone. And you can see some cars in the corner of the, the image. And what you've got underneath is, um, first of all, you've got a Byzantine city. And beneath the Byzantine city, you've got the Roman city. And beneath the Roman city, you've got the Greece city. For Thessalonica was founded by Alexander uh, in the 4th century BC. And it's been built again and again and again, and uh, usually on the, the same spot. But uh, the stones of the previous uh, structures were sometimes used. So here we are, and we're looking at a city, and their metro is almost open now. It was, it's been delayed for years because there were 300,000 archaeological artifacts of interest that uh, are now being uh, managed and cared for. Uh, by the antiquities uh, people in, in Greece. So uh, we, we, heard, uh, we heard Amanda read about another king. Uh, she read from uh, a version, she said it was the NIV, but, uh, and, and it used the idea of, of people who were upsetting the world, and I've used, in the, in the leaflet, I've used the heading, uh, turning the world upside down, which is from the authorized version. The people who are turning the world upside down have come here was the charge uh, against uh, Paul and his companions. So let me just pick up on that idea of turning. And I want to suggest, first of all, we're going to turn down uh, along the Via Ignatia. Then we're going to turn over the scriptures. Then we're going to ask about turning my life around. And then I want to see how they turned out Jason's house. I don't know if you can imagine a mob it's not too hard for us in Melbourne these days and then finally I want to think about the idea that God could be turning the world upside down in some way so let's just take these ideas briefly and one at a time first of all turning along the Via Ignatia this is Paul on the route now I showed you some time ago this map it, this is a part of a map which shows the entire Roman road network depicted uh, rather like the London Underground. And uh, across the top uh, here, uh, you have the Via Ignatia. The way the Romans moved across this part of the world was come down to Brindisi, here, cross uh, by boat to Dyrrhachium, and then the Via Ignatia went basically east from there. So this was the main Roman artery to the east. It ran all the way through to Byzantium. And then there were other road networks which take you down into Turkey today. So if you look at a physical map of this part of the world, uh, the Via Ignatia is marked in that very difficult to see color, red. I don't know if you can see it. I certainly find it difficult. But here it is, all the way across. So it's not, it's not dead straight the way the London Underground map shows it. 
but it's pretty, pretty clearly the main east-west route uh, through this part of the world, through Macedonia. And we left Paul last week in Philippi because he was coming in the other direction. He'd come across from Turkey uh, to Neapolis to Philippi, where there wasn't a Jewish synagogue, but the Jewish people and the, the non-Jewish people who had sided with the Jews who were praying to the one God instead of the Roman pantheon or the Greek pantheon, they, they met by the river uh, at a place to pray outside the city. And Paul met there, and we heard about Lydia. It says, the Lord opened her heart. She received the message. She was a woman, uh, obviously a woman of means. She had her own business. That's how she's described. She was a seller of high-end fabrics, purple from Thyatira. So here she was, and she and, and then not only a woman, but a jailer and then a slave. And so suddenly we had three people that one Jewish rabbi said you should pray and thank God that you were never, never a woman, never a slave, and uh, never a Gentile. And suddenly God brought together a woman, a slave, and a Gentile to be the foundation of the church in Europe. And now Paul's moving down the road to Thessalonica. How far is it? Well, it's a 31-hour walk, according to Google Maps. So it's 152 kilometers. And you heard at the beginning of the reading, uh, Armando just mentioned the two towns that he would likely enc encounter along the way, where no doubt he had uh, refreshments and, and stayed overnight. I uh, can't imagine they would try and do 31-hour walk non-stop. And as they came into to Thessalonica, um, the, the, the main one of the main roads in Thessalonica today is called the Via Ignatia. And it's also called the A24 not quite as romantic. Uh, and he would be looking for the synagogue because he was wanting a point of contact. He was wanting to get, speak into this culture and this city. Uh, so he went to where his fellow Jewish people were who had the scriptures. They had their Bibles. Uh, they had the scrolls. So they, they turned over the scriptures. That was what they did. Uh, they, they reasoned. They discussed. Paul had a message he wanted to proclaim, to make known. And, and he believed that certain things could be proved, demonstrated from the scriptures. Now, what he was seeking to show was amazing. First of all, that the Messiah, the one who is going to save not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well, was a Jewish person. That's a big ask. Every day, uh, Jewish people somewhere in the world are slandered or maligned. And, of course, they have to protest one way or another. Uh, but they know what it is to be, uh, to be marginalized and hurt. And who would want that for themselves? Um, but then, more than that, Paul's message was that a Jew, whom he believed was the Messiah, had been crucified, which was the most degrading and awful of deaths that they knew. Something that couldn't happen to a Roman citizen. It wasn't to be even thought about in polite company. But th this Jew had died, and wait for it, had risen from the dead. That's what he came with. That's the message that the anointed one, the Mashiach, the one that God had set his seal upon as his person, was not only a Jew, but a crucified Jew whom he raised to life. Well, where might he have been looking in the scriptures? Well, if you don't know, it would possibly be a good idea to start finding out. Uh, the Psalms, for example. Christine's already referred to Psalm 119. But the Psalms are, were the hymn book of the Jewish people. And so these were the prayers and the hymns that they used regularly. Look at them. Discover that Jesus on the cross, quoted from Psalm 22, and go through that psalm and see if you can avoid seeing a crucified person with others gambling for his clothes. And halfway through the psalm, the person who's being executed starts to say he will tell God's praise. Or turn to Isaiah 53, that amazing chapter which had such a huge influence on my own life when I was young, uh, 
and now I see it more in the context of uh, from chapter 40 through uh, 55, amazing section of poetry in which the Messiah is uh, taken from prison and judgment and put to death. And who shall declare his generation, says the apostle, because he was cut off out of the land of the living. Who is this of whom the prophet speaks? So if we are prepared to engage with those questions, we might find ourselves open to what Paul was saying and we might just find, as they, they uh, did it in the synagogue at, uh, at Thessalonica, that this message, uh, this is actually, this image is from a uh, TV series called The Chosen. It's a crowdfunded series uh, which depicts the life of Jesus uh, and the message of Christianity in a, in a new and fresh way. And this is filming a scene in a, in a synagogue. What was a synagogue? Well, synagogue was to gather. It's about gathering people together. S-Y-N is together, as in synoptic or uh, a few other words. Um, uh, so syn is the, is the Greek uh, prefix that has the idea of gathering people together. And, and in the synagogue, Jewish people worshipped. They sang the psalms. They prayed the prayers of the psalms. They discussed the scriptures. They, they educated. They educated the boys especially. It was regarded as especially important in the ancient world where not everybody got an education. But Jews valued education from the beginning and had their scriptures. And it was a place of community identity. And uh, in, in this uh, still from uh, The Chosen, we see the character who plays Jesus unrolling the scroll. The scroll was kept especially wrapped and uh, it was unrolled and it would be read week by week and uh, discussed and explained. And so this is what Paul would have been doing. As a visiting Jew, he could uh, could talk to them about the scriptures that they were looking at in that passage today, and he would talk about it with them. He would reason with them. He would discuss it, uh, and and they would be challenged by what they were reading and and learning. And it, it's uh, it's of interest to me uh, just uh, that in the, the John's Gospel, there's a there comes a point in chapter twelve which is the, the sort of climax of Jesus before he is uh, alone with his disciples for the Last Supper and washing their feet in chapter 13. There comes a point where Greek, the Greeks are seeking Jesus. He's getting a reputation and it's rippling out into the, the uh, Greek-speaking community um, that, that Jesus is, is, is gathering people to him. And... Uh, so they go to Philip, uh, one, of, one of the disciples with a Greek name, and they ask Philip if they can see Jesus. And Philip gets Andrew and, and, and uh, says, we've got these Greek people who want to see Jesus. Well, let's, let's see what the master says. So they go to Jesus and they, there's some Greek people wanting to see you. And Jesus says, the time has come. The time has come. God's glory is going to be revealed. This is the hour. And he talks about a grain of seed falling into the ground and dying. And unless it dies, it will abide alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. So it seems that the coming of the Greeks to hear Jesus was it like a trigger for him. And from then on, he ministers to the disciples. And that's the night of his arrest after that Passover and, and his death. So here we have... Uh, the Gentile people seeking Jesus. And the question is, um, could my life be turned around? Could your life be turned around about in this way? Well, we're, we hear in the, in the passage that uh, Amanda read that many of the, the Greek-speaking people did. It seems more of the non-Jewish than the Jewish people became believers. And, and uh, presumably they were turning from the Roman pantheon and the Greek pantheon, who knows for what reasons, but, but they have, were discovering in the one God of Israel, a God they couldn't see, that they could believe in. And so it was. And it wasn't just the men, it was many women, he says, and many leading women. We might like to speculate about why that would be the, of interest, um, 
for me, the very idea that the women could be treated with respect and inclusion and, uh, and perhaps the, the non-violence, uh, it seems to me things that would be attractive to women listeners, but we don't, we're not told. But the question really is, could it turn your life around? Could it change me? When I, when I think of evangelical, and I see myself as an evangelical Christian, uh, although the word has come into disrepute enormously uh, in, in certain contexts today, what, I'm, what I think of when I think of that is that I believe that there is a good news, a message, which calls for a response. It invites a change in our lives. We, we don't share this message um, without the hope that it will bring change to people's lives. We want people to enjoy the things that have been in, uh, enriching for us as we have grown in and known the message about Jesus. So the question would be, can words turn you around? Well, I think they can. Let's put it the other way. Words can turn me around. And words turn these people around. Not just Paul's words, but the words that they were reading in the scrolls. You know, there's a sort of a an authenticity that comes with durability. And if you've got a scroll that's a thousand years old or two thousand and it's recommending something that you discover people in the world today still recommend and enjoy, it, it has a powerful effect. When I preached on Thessalonians in 2019, I put in the, the uh, sermon handout that day uh, a photocopy of uh, a third century copy of the letter to the Thessalonians. That's the, as far as I know, it's the oldest part of the book of Thessalonians that we have. It's a papyrus fragment and it's cl clearly the text of, the Greek text of Thessalonians. So we know that these messages were shared, that they were found in the, in the, the uh, ruins of, of ancient Thessalonica. They found in the Byzantine era, of course, they found uh, many churches and they found Christian symbolism, a pair of earring crosses uh, and so on. So words can turn you around. Words can change you. Words changed Lydia in Philippi. It changed a large number of the leading women in Thessalonica as well as the men. Now, the men were expected. The men had uh, bigger roles in the synagogue than the women, but here the women too were engaged with the message and, and received it. But not everybody did. And so we're looking at turning up, stirring up the mob. There was a, an intention to create, uh, get rid of Paul and this message. It was upsetting many people in the synagogue. Not everybody who heard the message wanted it. And so there were some of the Jews who decided to take action against uh, Paul and Silas. And, and so they, they, uh, they stirred up the crowd. This wasn't what the Roman law decreed this way. That they, they were saying there was another king. Now this was probably in the time of the emperor Claudius. Claudius is actually one of the better emperors in the Roman world. He, he came uh, after Caligula, who was notorious, and he was preceded, sorry, he came after Caligula, but he was followed by Nero. So here are two emperors who just really brought the empire into disrepute. But Claudius uh, restored order uh, during his time as emperor. He saw the uh, takeover of Britain, a lot of uh, development on the western front of the empire. But there were some troublemakers from time to time. And the uh, historian Suetonius tells us, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christus, uh, he, the Emperor Claudius, expelled them from Rome. Now that's what Suetonius tells us. But we also get it in Acts chapter 18. So the next chapter of Acts, we are told about this, of certain people who the apostle encountered uh, this is further down in, in Corinth, that they had come across to Greece after being expelled from Rome. 
Now, what was the disturbance among the Jews that caused them to be expelled from Rome? Well, it's possible, and it seems likely to me, that the kind of disturbance that the Apostle Paul and Silas brought into the synagogue in Thessalonica was also happening right across the empire. And in Rome in particular, uh, there were disturbances as some of the Jews were being brought into the Christian fold and saying, well, Jesus is our Messiah. Now, I should say that Judaism wasn't just one thing. There were, as we know from the New Testament and from other sources, many different ideas in Judaism. There was, of course, a common core, the one unseen eternal creator God, Yahweh, uh, working through his people Israel. But the Pharisees and the scribes held very different views from each other. And the uh, community, the Qumran community down by the Dead Sea, they had given up on the temple worship, uh, which was controlled by the Sadducees, and they were doing their own thing down there. They'd given up on this, the structures up on the hill, up on the mountain. And, and the, the uh, zealots believed that an armed revolt was the only way to bring in the kingdom. But Jesus was saying, no, there is another way. And this disturbance that uh, some of these Jews in the synagogue uh, created in their reaction against Paul and Silas resulted in them going to the Agora. The Agora is the marketplace. This is, in fact, the Roman marketplace in Thessalonica. Uh, I'm not sure that in Paul's day it was double story, but it became a double story Roman Agora. And usually at the Agora there were people hoping for some employment, waiting for an opportunity uh, to gain something. And so we read that an unruly crowd was stirred up and they turned over Jason's place. They went to his house. They were uh, presumably being paid or encouraged. We've seen in Melbourne this week how quickly a, a mob can be brought together. Astonishingly, uh, we hear that they might even be brought together from people who worked it out in Germany or some other part of the world. Uh, the internet creates connections uh, of all kinds. And so here, here was Jason's house being turned over uh, by a crowd from the marketplace. They raided a house. Jason was taken into custody, but he had the resources uh, to pay the, uh, what we would call bail, to pay the money demanded. Uh, and the apostles had remained hidden. The messengers, the sent ones, what the, what the apostles means, they, they, they managed to stay out of the limelight and escape. And presumably Jason was one of those uh, Greek-speaking Jews who uh, sided with the apostle and took this message and had given them shelter. So the question then is, after turning out Jason's house, what about turning the world upside down? Did the charge of the reactionaries hold true? There is another king. Well, this was the seditious message of the New Testament. That Caesar, for all his power, and for all that he is depicted in, in graphical images in textbooks, uh, at, as the peak, the apex of humanity, just a little bit above ordinary humans, he actually separated from ordinary humans as divine. Because when, when uh, the, the, uh, far, the stepfather, really, of, of uh, Augustus, Julius Caesar, when he died, Augustus de declared that uh, he was the son of a god, that, uh, that Julius Caesar had been like a god. And then when Tiberius came after uh, Augustus, he said the same. He was the son of a god. And so what was happening was, in these years of changing emperors, was that they were competing for the God position in society. And Paul's message was that a crucified Jew was the one on whom God set his seal, that this was the one we were to listen to, that this was the one who had come with a hopeful message for the world. You know, Greg Sheridan released a book uh, a couple of years ago. He released one this year as well. But 
He re released one a couple of years ago called God is Good for You. And in one moment in it, he parodies Monty Python. I don't know if you, I haven't seen the whole film, but I watched the clip about this where uh, John Cleese says to his people gathered round, what do the Romans ever do for us? And after a pause, somebody says, uh, aqueducts. And then one by one, they slowly all start to suggest the sorts of things that might have actually been beneficial from the Roman Empire. So Greg Sheridan says this, what did we ever get from Christianity? Apart from the idea of the individual, human rights, feminism, liberalism, modernity, social justice, and secular politics. So when you look at the world and ask, where are these treasured ideas and ideals? It's pretty obvious that they come from what was once called Christendom, that the the ideas that have come to us through the holy scriptures of Judaism and Christianity in particular have shaped our ideas about the individual. We are created in the image of God. We are not forgotten by God. And each of us matters to God and should matter to one another. And if it's come from a patriarchal culture, we need to remember the matriarchy as well and liberalism that ideas can be shared and we can sit down and look at the text together. And modernity, the modern world, the ideas of social justice, the idea of separation of church and state. These ideas are all there. The gods of Greece and Rome, they, well, I think Les Murray puts it very well in one of his, the end of one of his poems. He said, the true God gives his flesh and blood. Idols demand yours off you. There's an Australian ring to it, doesn't it? <coughs> Idols demand yours off you. This scene he has coming from the trenches where men are fighting and dying. He says the true God gives his flesh and blood. Idols demand yours off you. And so it is that as we read the New Testament, we hear the call to get the world the right side up and to begin with ourselves to start thinking what are the foundations of my hope why do I where do I gather strength and hope from how can I be the kind of person that would be the best version of me what would Jesus say to me about this well you remember his two great commandments to love the Lord your God the unseen eternal creator, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so it is that Jesus pursued that costly path and he invites us to follow him. Now, if we want to get the world the right way up, we should linger on this and, and dwell on this. And I would like to uh, suggest to you that next week I'm going to do just one uh, so service uh, thinking about a main idea from the letters Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. He had to get out of there pretty quickly. Maybe he was there a month, maybe, uh, maybe two months at the most. But he had to get on to Berea, Athens, and then Corinth. And he stayed in Corinth for two years. We're going to follow that road. But next week I want to look at the letter, one main idea from the letter he wrote to the Thessalonian Christians. It's only five chapters in the first letter. You could read them this week, no trouble. Why don't you read that letter, see how he loved those people whom he had to leave in a hurry, and uh, see what emphasis he puts in his letter. And we'll explore that next week. In the meantime, may God help our world to be turned the right way up. As we think about this, I'm going to invite you to uh, listen to uh, the music uh, as we respond to the word made flesh, turning the world right way up, person by person. Thank you to Amanda and Sue for being with us today.
glasses are falling out. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you to Amanda and Sue for being with us this morning to play that beautiful music. We're now going to have a short time of prayer and I'm going to pray that uh, God will weave his beautiful harmonies into our lives, into the lives of our community. So shall we turn to God in prayer? Let us unite our hearts. Almighty God, we bow to thank you for the message of Jesus, for the way the good news he has brought to the world can be spoken and communicated personally, as well as written and shared across geographic distances 
and translated and shared over cultural divides. We thank you that in the 2,000 years since Jesus walked the earth, all or part of the message has been translated into more than 3,415 of the world's languages. We are so privileged to have a rich heritage in the multiple editions we have inherited. More than this, we have received the news from people who deeply loved both your word and us as persons in your image. Today we thank you that the message can also be transmitted by electronic and digital media. Thank you that we can come to you and to your word via the internet. Help us not to be merely hearers of the word, but doers also. We pray today for the many who do not yet have the scriptures in their mother tongue. Advance the work of translation using the resources of those who love you and want your ways of mercy and love to be more widely known. We think today also of the many who find reading difficult and disorienting, who are at a loss for words. Help us to play a part in promoting literacy and encouraging engagement with the message of Jesus. We are challenged as we hear that leading women became Jesus' disciples in Thessalonica and observe that in some parts of the world, girls are denied education and many children live in drastically reduced circumstances and have little or no chances to be educated. Help us to be as passionate about the opportunities to read and write as previous generations were for us, their descendants. Turn lives around today, as you did with the opening of your word in Thessalonica. At this time, when unrest and impatience are so evident on the streets and in social media, reach by your spirit into our society. Enrich us with the wisdom, goodness and truth that are in Jesus Christ. We're grateful that the Melbourne earthquake caused so little damage. Help those who still struggle after the loss of so much in Haiti and Canary Isles. We have so much. Grant that from our bounty we may contribute to those who have suffered loss, loss of home, loss of income, even the ability to provide food and clothing for their children. Guide our politicians as they seek to implement the best advice in responding to the pandemic. Help us by compliance not to put others at risk and to encourage all to get vaccinated. Thank you for the lead given by the USA in buying vaccines for the poorer nations. Help the World Health Organization as they implement the challenging task of vaccinating in difficult and remote areas. Help us in Australia as in other of the world's wealthy nations to play our part. As we think of Tunisia today, we lament the stifling of the so-called Arab Spring. Bring the blessing of your word to the Arab world. We commit the personnel and missions of the Middle East Reform Fellowship and Arab World Media to you today. We remember the frail elderly and sick friends, along with parents of school children in lockdown holidays. Bring encouragement and hope to them now as we commit them to you in the quietness of our hearts. Speak into their situations, Heavenly Father, to remind them that there are underneath them everlasting arms, and may friends provide that encouragement. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God bless you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those whom you love today and always.